Picture this. A team emerges from the depths of defeat in the early 1960s. A team that has now become the most iconic and valuable franchise in NFL history. A team no one can stop talking about. The Cowboys experience has been in the making for 64 years. Football is dead, my boy. Whether you love them or you hate them, you're going to watch them. A football story of heightened visibility and relentless scrutiny. For players, coaches, and leadership, it can bring unparalleled opportunity. For fans, it has instilled a sense of passion and pride. While rivals and haters are forced to deal with the Cowboys' inherent allure and the excess of sports fame. This is the enduring power of the star, a symbol that transcends the game, embodying both the grandeur and the tribes of the Dallas Cowboys. Roger takes the snap. Pumps and watch. He's going long. In the 1960s, the Dallas Cowboys were born into the NFL. Not with a bang, but with humbling defeat. The team, hastily assembled and untested, struggled to find its footing in a league dominated by established franchises. Having limited finances and facilities only added to the daunting task of building a competitive roster from scratch. 34. It's on two, ready? Last play. Back in those days, everything was exciting, even losses, because we were starting, we were struggling, and every day was a, was a new experience. It's taken visionary leadership and innovative strategies to transform the Cowboys into a powerhouse. Over the eras of professional football, the Cowboys have navigated the pressures and challenges that come with being in the spotlight of the sports world. They've experienced the highs of Super Bowl triumphs and the bleakness of seasons spent rebuilding. But through it all, the star has shined bright. from the three. Shotgun, double slot, snap is back, Romo quarterback draw, up the middle, runs it in. Tony Romo has the first quarterback draw touchdown at Cowboys Stadium and Dallas regains the lead. No stars shine brighter than quarterbacks and the Dallas Cowboys history is emphasized by legendary field generals who have led the team. The snap, quick set, looks Each right. has brought a unique blend of leadership, skill, and grit to the game, and have shouldered the weight of an intense expectation to win. That's part of the deal. The quarterbacks get paid well, they get the notoriety, and there's a high price to pay for the recognition they get, good or bad. Don Meredith brought much needed charisma and toughness to a fledgling franchise. By scoring four touchdowns. You guys want some close-ups? Meredith played a significant role in shaping the team's early identity. That's a good move. Let go, kid. I love Don, and there's a reason they called him Dan. <laughs> His charisma and comic go, nature caught the nation's attention. But it wasn't enough to stop the media from criticizing him any time his performance faltered. It was really a screwed up looking thing. I didn't even know what to, yeah, I think they did. I think they missed it because I didn't, I didn't want the audible. The physical beatings he took on the field 
wore him down over time. Meredith retired unexpectedly at the relatively young age of 31. When you can't emotionally get yourself geared for a game, and mentally you can't concentrate and prepare yourself to do your job, get out. His cowboy's exposure led to numerous opportunities, including a successful broadcasting career after his retirement where his personality was on full display. They say that all good things must end. Call it a night. As Don Meredith hung up his cleats, the Dallas Cowboys welcomed a promising Heisman Trophy winner to the team in 1969. For three, set! Roger Staubach, also known as Captain America for his Navy service in Vietnam, elevated the Cowboys with his leadership and clutch performances. Roger stood out among quarterbacks of his era for his unique combination of athleticism and instinctive playmaking. Uh, he believed he could do things when the odds were a little bit against him. Look no further than the Hail Mary pass. Roger, he's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. He was a leader. He was the classiest person, unbelievable teammate. He was tough as nails. As a quarterback, you got to keep your poise. You can't uh, get overly emotional. You've got to be competitive, aggressive, and give everything you have physically. We talk about character being above reproach. His was absolutely shiny, and he carried that over onto the field as well. Roger Staubach is the standard for quarterbacks for the Cowboys, and that bar is as high as it could possibly be. Tom Landry is the nuts and bolts, and I appreciate him. I appreciate my teammates through the years, because I'm one that's been successful in this system. There's been a lot of good ones, and there'll be many more good ones. But I, uh, <clears throat> I thank the Cowboys, and I'm retired. He will forever be considered one of the best to wear the star. Danny White, the Dallas Cowboys quarterback from 1980 to 1988, faced the pressure of living up to the high expectations set by his predecessor. Fans tend to magnetize to the bigger names, and rightfully so, but somewhere in between that was Danny White keeping this team relevant in the post-Roger Staubach days. If there was anybody I would like to copy myself after, it would probably be Roger, but I'm not going to try to do that. I'm going to do the things that Danny White does best. The comparisons will come and the criticisms will come based on what Roger did, and I realize that. He led the Cowboys to three consecutive NFC Championship games, but failed to win any. The end of Danny White's career was marked by challenges and diminishing performance. When White retired, he was respected for his dedication and contributions to the team during a transitional period in history, but he was overshadowed by those who came both before and after him. Troy Aikman was the first draft choice made under the new regime of owner Jerry Jones and head coach Jimmy Johnson. Troy's a, a very talented player, and we knew he had the physical talents. We knew he was an intelligent quarterback. Aikman's role was pivotal in transforming the Cowboys into an offensive machine. When they needed him most to be that flat, steady personality, that's what he was, and that's one huge reason why the Cowboys were able to win not one, not two, but three Super Bowls with Troy Aikman at the hill. What a ride it's been. Troy Aikman's the MVP. As Aikman moved into the later parts of his career, he faced a series of several back issues that were exasperated by years of taking hits from NFL defenses. He was getting injured some, they were losing more games, different coaching style with Barry Switzer. I think for him, just the frustration just continued to mount because they were losing more than, than he was used to. Hey guys, that's a embarrassment out there. Junior League. Tired of being a guy who's got to run down everybody's damn throat all the time. The penalty of success is often exhaustion. After failing to complete the 2000 season due to a back injury, Aikman retired in April 2001. And you watch it and you think that your time will never come. Yeah, my time's come. Aikman's legacy is enshrined in the hearts of fans, 
symbolizing a golden era of Cowboys history. Here come the early 2000s, post-Troy Aikman era, and Cowboys fans ran right into the brick wall that had graffiti sprayed on it that read QB Purgatory. Quincy Carter, Vinny Testaverde, Drew Bledsoe, take your pick. The franchise and a fan base was spoiled because they always had a quarterback. But again, because of the brand, the Cowboys franchise was still front and center. The Cowboys were lost and in dire need of a star who could guide them step, out. Let's roll. Tell you what, boys, we got a lot to do here. We got a lot to do. Come on, kid. Come on, Tony. Throw it, throw it, throw it. That a boy, you got it? That a boy, Tony. That star turned out to be Tony Romo. Known for his improvisational skills and clutch passes, Romo's presence revitalized the Cowboys offense. There was Bill Parcells wanting to give this young man a chance. His first start in 2006 was promising, but the pressure of leading a high-profile team like the Cowboys was immense. Meanwhile, here's Dramatica. Romo holds. Oh, and it's fumbled by Romo, and then Romo's going to run to the end zone, and he's going to get tackled by Jordan Babbitt. I don't know that I've ever felt this low, you know, at any point. So. But Romo's resilience was evident. He achieved remarkable success on field and set several franchise records for passing yards and touchdowns. He changed everything for this team and really took them to another Blitz level. Is on. Oh. He was one oh. the pass is Injuries on. began to take a toll and eventually led to missed games. Getting hurt when you feel like you have the best team you've ever had was a soul-crushing moment for me. And through it all, you have a tremendous amount of guilt on having let your teammates, fans, and organization down. Well, they were depending on you to bring them a championship. That's what quarterbacks are supposed to do. That's how we're judged. You see, football is a meritocracy. You aren't handed anything. You earn everything, every single day, over and over again. You have to prove it. Well, that's the way the football works. A great example of this is Dak Prescott and what he's done. He's earned the right to be our quarterback. Romo retired in April of 2017. He's remembered as an exciting player who led the franchise out of the dark age that came before. Dak Prescott, the leader of the modern Cowboys, has brought renewed energy to the franchise with his dynamic playmaking ability and on-field leadership. Let's, go, Let's have a day now. Let's have a day now. Let's go. Let's he go, demonstrates man. strong arm accuracy, mobility, and the ability to lead game-winning drives. Prescott dealt with a severe ankle injury in the 2020 season. This injury raised concerns about his long-term durability and his ability to return to peak form. Prescott silenced doubters when he came back even better after this injury. He is one of the better humans to ever walk through the doors of the Dallas Cowboys organization. His work in the community is bar none. He continued to persevere and he continued to use that adversity to make the world a better place. Our adversity, our struggles, what we go through is always gonna to be too much for ourselves and maybe too much for even one or two people, but never, never too much for a community. Dak Prescott has already proven that he can be one of the best Cowboys quarterbacks of all time. And then what he has to prove is that he can win the Super Bowl. Well, we've been in the playoffs 15 of the last 16 years. And so this, this puts a pretty tough burden on you because you not only uh, have to look forward to the first objective of winning your division, but for the Cowboys, the only success is the Super Bowl. We now explore the stories of two iconic figures who have shaped the legacy of the star, Tex Schramm and Jerry Jones. The early 1960s were a crucible for the Cowboys, testing their resolve and determination. Despite early losses, the foundation of what was to come was being built off the field by Cowboys general manager, Tex Schramm. 
After being hired as general manager, Schramm then hired coach Tom Landry and player personnel director Gil Brandt, who together transformed the Cowboys into an elite team by the mid-1960s. Schramm was a powerful figure for the Cowboys and the NFL. Tex Schramm was such a forward thinker. Instant replay. Do you like that? Tex Schramm. Do you enjoy watching the Dallas Cowboys cheerleaders? Tex Schramm. Do you enjoy the scouting process and the analytics portion of it? Tex Schramm. Do you enjoy watching the Cowboys on Thanksgiving while you enjoy your turkey and helpings with your family? Tex Schramm. There is a laundry list of innovations that were created in the mind of Tex Schramm that are now perpetuated onto the NFL as we know it. Schramm aggressively pursued merchandise and licensing deals that capitalized on the team's growing popularity. The star became one of the most recognizable symbols in sports, appearing on everything from jerseys and hats to consumer products. This extensive merchandising ingrained the Cowboys brand into popular culture. Facing financial struggles going into the 1980s, original owner Clint Murchison Jr. sold the Cowboys in 1984 to Bum Bright, a Dallas-based businessman and oil magnate. By 1988, the Cowboys finished with their worst record since their inaugural season, a dismal 313. Bright's dissatisfaction with this performance made him open to selling the franchise. It didn't help that an oil bust had severely strained Bright's finances as well. Amidst this backdrop, a new potential buyer appeared. A businessman from Arkansas, Jerry Jones. It's tough when you break a relationship that we've had for 29 years. But we must win. Jones' acquisition started with a bang earning the ire of many with his controversial decision to fire the franchise's head coach of 29 years. The media frenzy that followed was relentless. And I really did know how he was revered and respected as the coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And I basically said, coach, the thing that I do feel is in best interest of everyone is that we make the coaching change right now. Coach Landry shook my hand. Uh, he was uh, majestic. Uh, he was just as you would expect Coach Landry to be, and uh, said, I wish you the best, and uh, uh, we parted. Jerry Jones knew right off the bat the way the Tom Landry situation was handled was wrong. He said that two days after it happened. He gave himself an F. Although he was forced to make that decision, he never, ever lost respect or reverence for what Tom Landry was able to help build. Shortly after Landry's firing, Schramm would also bow out. Landry would be replaced by Jimmy Johnson, the head coach of the Miami Hurricanes. Proud to be the head football coach for the Dallas Cowboys. There could have been better circumstances as far as me coming into this position, but I would hope that people would be as excited about this organization, about this football team, as what I am. Hey, that boy looks crippled. I hope he can run back. <laughs> no, he looks good. This shakeup planted the seeds of success, with Johnson leading the team to back-to-back -to -back Super Bowls. However, Jones and Johnson's relationship did not sell smoothly. When I talk about the Cowboys being on that roller coaster ride, I think there is one called Jimmy and Jerry. We're going to bring it back in about five minutes, folks. Good to see you. Excited? Oh, yeah, man. After their last championship, the pressure to remain on top finally began to wear on the organization. He and Mikey are joining forces. Even in this slump, there was one sector that saw revolutionary improvement. Under Jones's leadership, the Dallas Cowboys aggressively pursued media and sponsorship deals that boasted the prosperity of the franchise and the brand. He was instrumental in securing a $1 billion broadcasting deal with Fox Sports, which increased league exposure and revenue. And he kind of taught the NFL how to run a business, how to make money. Our interest in doing those kinds of things with great companies, and of course, uh, uh, I had hoped that if we could do it well, the league could do it well. 
By the early 2000s, Texas Stadium, the iconic home of the Dallas Cowboys, was showing signs of age and declining infrastructure. The bearers of the star needed a new battleground to call home. The result was AT&T Stadium, a world-class venue that is recognized around the globe. I hope there's some cowboy fans here. Jones was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2017. His induction recognized his transformative contributions to the sport as his trailblazing pursuits have shaped the league. Jerry bought the team for $140 million. Today, the Cowboys have reached a sports milestone, being valued at over $10 billion. Schramm's leadership oversaw the Cowboys' rise to prominence, establishing the bedrock on which the team still rests. Jones built upon this legacy, propelling the franchise into a new era of success with bold business strategies and a desire to prosper. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Tom Landry, Tex Schramm, and Gil Brandt. I couldn't have built the Cowboys today if it weren't for what they did, the shoulders I stood on, I'm deeply indebted to those three. Okay, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. 323! 323! Red dog fast, okay? Hot! Hot! That right away, okay, that's the boy. That's the way to go, okay? That's the way to go. That's Tatum. You, you better be ready, I tell you, when you go through there. If you get through there, you better holler, Tatum! Tom Landry was a football pioneer. The schemes and concepts he brought to Dallas created a juggernaut. Six, seven, pop, wing down and in. There won't be a soul in there. Okay. Biggest advantage of the shotgun is getting back deep in a shorter period of time. His calm, stoic demeanor and trademark fedora were sketched into the minds of fans. You don't even see his face, you know exactly who that is, and that screams iconic legend for the Cowboys. You know, everything is confidence in football, professional football, and uh, you build confidence over a lot of years. Landry led the Cowboys to two Super Bowl victories and 20 consecutive winning seasons. He's the guy that put this franchise on the map. Think about that, 20 consecutive winning seasons, 1966 through 1985. Tom Landry is the most iconic Dallas Cowboy of all time. The rise of new dynamic teams outpaced Landry's playbooks in the 1980s. The Cowboys' dominance began to wane. And as I've gone through the, the game of football through the years, uh, I've been able to cope with the defeats and learn how to overcome them, to endure to the point that you can come back the next time and compete harder. Tom Landry is immortalized in the Pro Football Hall of Fame and is one of the greatest coaches of all time. New Cowboys owner Jerry Jones was on the phone, taking charge as he promised he would do. Meanwhile, on the other side of Valley Ranch, Tom Landry sat in his office. Landry quietly emptied 29 years of his life into cardboard boxes. He says he's not bitter, change comes with the new owner, and that people will forget him soon. But there's no forgetting a legend. But life goes on for the Cowboys. This is the burning desire I have in me to, to be the best at that level. And this kind of opportunity doesn't come open ever again. And I've got to do it. Welcome to Valley Ranch, Coach. <laughs> Jimmy Johnson, the head coach known for his fierce leadership, was instrumental in initiating one of the most dramatic rebuilds in NFL history. Ask my mind. Get over there on that other field and have some ass. Stripped down the roster, brought in a whole bunch of new guys, traded Herschel Walker. With all the draft picks that we have, I really believe that we're going to make some major steps in the next couple of years. Johnson's coaching style was defined by his demanding expectations and his ability to motivate his players to realize their potential, fostering a competitive environment that pushed the team to its limits. Jimmy 
took the worst team in the league and turned them into champions within four years. Setting an almost unachievable bar for any coaches that followed. Everybody's kind of gotten a kick out of. Uh... Despite the trophies, Johnson's relationship with owner Jerry Jones began to fray. We have mutually decided that I would no longer be the head football coach with the Dallas Cowboys. When Jimmy and Jerry split up, nobody really had a good reason. And so that, that's what made it so tough. I really didn't. I mean, I had a feeling. His eventual placement in the Cowboys ring of honor symbolizes Jimmy as a cowboy forever. Barry Switzer became head coach of the Dallas Cowboys after Jimmy Johnson left, his arrival marking the start of a continuing cycle of a coach left in the shadow of his predecessors. I'm tan, rested, and ready. You know, that's all I can say to you. I'm ready to go. I want to start tomorrow. I hope I can do as good a job as Jimmy Johnson. That's what you're hoping, and that's damn sure what you're hoping. That's why I'm here. We got a job to do, and we're going to do it, baby! <laughs> Switzer was given a more than capable roster to win a third title in a row, and that was the expectation. He basically was on his couch, goes to coach the team. 12-4 and four, and a trip to the NFC Championship game is considered a failure. Does and goes deep. Pass is incomplete. The next year, it was like, okay, you got to win a Super Bowl. Otherwise, this move is, you know, doesn't work. Damn disappointed we didn't win last year. But I'm gonna tell you, I don't dwell on it. I don't dwell on it. Life's too short. Let's go on down the road. Let's do it again this year. The Switzer era peaked in his second year when he guided the Cowboys to victory in Super Bowl 30. We did it, everyone, baby! We did it! We did it! We did it! You did it! By 1997, amid declining team performance and increasing scrutiny, Switzer resigned from his position. He successfully managed a talented team to a Super Bowl victory. It was such a well-built Ferrari by Jimmy and Jerry. All Barry Switzer had to do was keep it in between the lines, and Barry Switzer was able to do that. I know we got to throw the ball deep a couple times, OK? We are playing so good. Chan Gailey and Dave Campo each served as head coach for the Dallas Cowboys during a transitional period in the late 1990s and early 2000s. They were tasked with guiding a franchise that was navigating the aftermath of its dynasty era. The Cowboys lost in free agency 25 starters. Starters, they were in cap hell. You don't have a quarterback and you don't have a depth, you're not going to win any games. Chan Gailey and Dave Campo illustrate the complexities of leading a high-profile team through periods of change and the intense criticism that comes with the head coaching position of the Dallas Cowboys. The opportunity to ask Bill Parcells to be the new head coach of the Dallas Cowboys was obvious to me. Once a championship coach, Bill Parcells took over as head coach of the Dallas Cowboys in 2003. Parcells immediately set about transforming the team's culture, emphasizing That's new it. philosophies Good. and schemes. Perfect. Perfect. Good job. He Good revamped man. the roster, notably bringing in key players like Demarcus Ware and Jason Witten. They had had 5 and 11 three straight years. Parcells was brought in to change that. Football, this is it tonight, boy. They're playing Carolina 2003. Carolina's good football. Down at the 20 and the ball is on the floor. Brady James. Cowboys had won seven games. Snap to Quincy, three steps, no draw. Pump thing looking, pump throws it. Most of the end zone, caught, touchdown, Galloway. Throws it out, Whitten caught it, first down. This was by far the best win that I've had here in Dallas. And it was a hard fought game. You can't call them losers anymore. Is there something else now? Under his guidance, the Cowboys returned to the playoffs in 2003 and again in 2006, giving the franchise a jolt of life. Hiring of the Tuna absolutely reinvigorated the Cowboys fan base and it helped turn the culture around. After four seasons with the Cowboys, Parcells retired from coaching after the 2006 season. 
His influence laid the groundwork for the Cowboys to build upon in following years. Under Wade Phillips, the Cowboys experienced immediate success, achieving a 13-3 record and winning the NFC East in his first season. Phillips' defensive expertise was evident, but his tenure was marred by inconsistency. Chaos in Dallas. Jerry Jones decided he had seen enough. Jones firing Wade Phillips. And, and he basically lost the team. Jerry needed to make the move. Uh, doing things that allow us to win football games. Under Garrett, the Cowboys aimed to build through the draft. And all of a sudden, Garrett started putting that team back together. You know, we had some opportunities a few years. We're right on the cusp of it, and unfortunately, in those divisional rounds, we couldn't break through and get to the championship game. But uh, I was so proud of the coaches that we had and the players. You know, when you're a coach, it's such a unique situation to be in. This is our dream, play and coach football for the Dallas Cowboys. Go embrace that. And uh, when we're at our best, we certainly did that. The tenures of Wade Phillips and Jason Garrett are reflective of a franchise striving to recapture its former glory. Mike McCarthy took over as head coach of the Dallas Cowboys in 2020. His arrival was met with optimism as he was expected to revitalize a talented Cowboys roster. While McCarthy's focus on building a resilient team culture has shown current success, he still aims to guide the Cowboys back to their former status as champions. The fight is, is they haven't won a Super Bowl in 30 years. That's not Mike McCarthy's problem, but, but it is something he has to deal with, you know? And so uh, and that's, that's why I think the toughest part of being a coach. The legacies of heroes like Tom Landry and Jimmy Johnson loom large amidst this pressure. The true essence of being a Cowboys coach shines through to face the challenges head on, to inspire their players, and to strive for greatness knowing that their efforts are part of a larger, storied franchise. The Dallas Cowboys have always been more than just a football team. They are a lightning rod for both admiration and criticism. As the media landscape has evolved, the Cowboys have been cast as the perpetual protagonist and antagonist of the NFL. A single misstep can lead to an avalanche of criticism, while every victory is a chance to momentarily quiet the doubters. The Cowboys were fortunate enough to start their life as another institution began to experience rapid growth in American life. Broadcast television. Soon the team was in living rooms across the nation, but not all the attention they gathered that decade was positive. In 1963, the team was suddenly the target of the nation's anger after the John F. Kennedy assassination. President Kennedy got assassinated in Dallas. There was this natural hate for anything in Dallas, including the Cowboys. You got Cowboy fans all over the country, right? But then you have these other people that hated the Cowboys. So you put that together, and if they were playing on TV, people were either cheering for the Cowboys to win or cheering for the Cowboys to lose. And guess what? That's still taking place to this day. I wanted and felt that the Cowboys should win, number one. You can't do anything if you don't win. But once you win, then become a team that is looked on as something special. The 1970s saw the Cowboys ascend to national prominence. By the early 1980s, ESPN had become a household name, providing 24-hour sports coverage that included extensive highlights and live broadcast of Cowboy games. The 1990s heralded a new era of success for the Cowboys. The Cowboys constantly drew high ratings for primetime games, which in turn increased advertising revenue. Three Super Bowl victories ensured lifelong fans were all in on the Cowboys experience. The post-dynasty years were marked by critical media analysis of the Cowboys' struggles, focusing on coaching changes and inconsistent performances. 
However, Jerry Jones continued to leverage the Cowboys' popularity to help secure lucrative television contracts for the NFL. The fact of the matter is, as long as the Cowboys exist and they're not going anywhere, TV networks will pay a premium dollar to get them on their broadcast, and it's because you and I and everyone else will make sure that we're seated and glued to the tube when that happens. The media knows that you put that star on TV, people are going to watch it. In the late 2000s, social media platforms and smartphones changed the media landscape forever. The Cowboys' presence on these platforms ensures they remain at the forefront of sports conversations for better or worse. Everybody is watching every practice clip, every highlight from their home. And so with social media, now you've got a lot more judges, a lot more critics, and the moment is so much more visible than it's ever been. For a Cowboys player, you just have to know you're gonna be one of the most scrutinized athletes on the entire planet but the rewards are also very obvious and glaring as well. Your name is on a heightened platform. More people globally are gonna know you. If you're looking to build your brand outside of the game so that once you retire, you can parlay that into other opportunities. Couldn't tell by him, though. Stand on the field long enough, he... The Dallas Cowboys' super. relationship with the media has been a dynamic and evolving one, characterized by intense scrutiny and enduring fascination. The Dallas Cowboys became undisputed champions of the National Football League by winning Super Bowl VI. Well, Tom, uh, let me say this on uh, behalf of Southern Life Insurance Company, and I'm sure I speak for the many, many uh, Cowboy fans all over the country that we're all mighty proud of you. We're proud of your great staff and your great football team, and we're most happy for you. Well, thank you, Phil. We appreciate that very much. Of course, we're, we thank a lot of our fans. They've supported us through all these years, and uh, they mean a lot to our team because it gives us real incentive to do a good job every time we step on the field. The brand power of the Dallas Cowboys transcends the realm of sports, reaching into the very fabric of American culture. The star is not merely a logo. It is a statement of identity innovation and tradition. In 1978, NFL Films coined the term America's Team in a highlight reel reflecting the Cowboys' widespread popularity and national appeal. Of course, it's a lofty claim and it puts a target on the franchise. It's a title that must be declared with pride and unwavering confidence and Cowboy fans have done that. I think when you have such a wide, diverse fan base, even some struggles doesn't deter true fans. If you're a fan, you're a fan. You don't quit as a fan, and I think that the brand is that strong. It always has been that strong, and I would imagine it continues to be that strong. When they watch in person or tune into their televisions, Cowboys fans come with high expectations, while rivals come with resentment. The pride for Cowboys fans needs to come from understanding the legacy of the Dallas Cowboys. 100% I understand that as of late, it's been a challenge. The drought is long and everybody's thirsty. Just keep in mind, that history can in fact repeat itself because everything moves in cycles. And that means once the Cowboys do figure out how to get back to the promised land, they'll probably stay there for a little. Fans know what this team has been, a team that clawed its way to the top of the ladder from unlikely beginnings, a team that's fostered a history of innovation and excellence, a team that's had some of the most interesting personalities to take the field. They are inheritors of a grand legacy, a legacy emblazoned on every helmet. They are the Dallas Cowboys, and their star shines bright.
Thank you.